it's as if you cut the human hair 10 times and then you need to go with one of those tools in between those layers while the patient is awake. And that's something that humans just cannot do. That's where robots come in. Age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, is an eye condition that affects millions of people around the world. In the UK, it's the biggest cause of sight loss. Here in London, scientists are developing a new treatment that could help people see again. The project is a collaboration between King's College London and Moorfields Eye Hospital. Eye surgeon Professor Lyndon de Cruz is the clinical lead. AMD, which stands for age-related macular degeneration, is a very common condition in the community. In the eighth decade, up to a third of the population will have some form of this disease. And essentially, the degenerative component implies something is lost or something is being lost. And what is being lost are the nerves you actually see with, uh, the rods, the cones, and other structures within the eye uh, that ultimately turn light into vision. I think uh, most people are aware that the eye is a ball, uh, but it's a hollow ball, and the inside of the eye is lined with a sheet of nerves. This is the retina I was referring to. And the sheet lines probably two-thirds of the inside of the eyeball. But the area we're talking about, the macula, is a small area which has a disc diameter of about six millimeters, so it's tiny. And right in the center of that, there's another structure called the fovea, which is half a millimeter across, which contains what you would call your vision. So in fact, it affects a very tiny amount of the eye itself, a very tiny amount of this nerve layer inside the eye, but it has a devastating effect because it's able to knock out all your useful vision in a relatively small area. Uh, and those cells, because they're neural cells, just like spinal cord cells or brain cells, don't regenerate. And this is the real problem. Uh, and therefore, once they're lost, the vision goes down and the vision is lost permanently. And currently, we have no way of replacing the cells and also there's no natural way of these cells regenerating. The macular part of macular degeneration implies that these cells are lost from a very specific area of the eye, and this area is where the high quality vision comes from. The vision that you read with, see television, in fact, see the nuance on people's faces. And unfortunately for the population that have it, they lose a really important part of their enjoyment and their function. They, they um, always say that they miss reading, they can't really see the people they're talking to well, they can't see the television, they certainly can't drive. So it's very uh, impactful on their lives. And this is why it's such a difficult disease to deal with for, for patients. It affects the best bit first and only. This I won't be so good at. Douglas Tredgett was first diagnosed with AMD in 1996 and is the patient representative for the research. I first noticed it when we were traveling in Spain in um, about 96, 98, and um, I was driving along and I suddenly noticed like a raindrop on the eye, um, a little bit of blurred vision, very, very small. Um, and I just thought, oh, you know, I go to bed and in the morning it'll be gone, <laughs> but it wasn't. Um, so as soon as we got back, I rang the optician and the optician said, go immediately to uh, emergency department at an eye hospital and they diagnose macular degeneration um, and from then it slowly deteriorates I think in 2008 uh, I had to give up driving and about the same time I, I stopped working nothing is clear it's sort of I wouldn't describe it as blurred but it's not crisp as it ought to be um, and, and faces are very, very difficult. What, why, why faces should be difficult, I don't know. But it's, I think it's because it's the central vision which actually goes first. One thing Douglas hasn't had to give up is his bridge club. He's able to zoom on his computer screen and use his peripheral vision to see the game. It's all uh, about the central vision. Yeah, so that's why... Um, sorry, it's from here. That's why um, you tend to move around a lot, to, you know, to fi find the best place. Douglas also uses his computer to sit in on the quarterly meetings to hear updates on the research. 
and is keen to see how the project develops. Advances in regenerative therapies made this project possible. In the first phase of trials, Professor de Cruz worked with Professor Pete Coffey, who grew stem cell patches which were implanted into the retinas of two patients. Both went from not being able to read at all, even with glasses, to reading 60 to 80 words per minute with normal reading glasses. The first generation treatments we've done, which we've already carried out in people, involves putting a sheet of cells between two other structures. Initially, because we don't have the thing to transplant, you can't take nerves easily from another person and transplant them, uh, and therefore we need another source. And stem cells, these are cells that can be turned into anything, have given us the opportunity for the first time to create the missing nerves in the laboratory and then transplant those missing nerves back into the eye. And so we are looking at various strategies to, one, grow these nerves or create these nerves in the laboratory, and strategies to transplant them back into the eye at the right time in the course of the disease. You can see in this picture, we have the optic nerve. This is the normal structure in the blood vessels of the eye, but next to it, in the area that I talked about called the macula, you'll see this transplant of new cells in a sheet, this bullet-shaped structure here. And this is the transplant that we created in the laboratory and transplanted in. And because that sheet is physically larger, it's six by three millimeters, even though it's only a, about one twenty thousandth of a millimeter thick, we can see it and therefore we can hold it and put it in. So it's able to be done by conventional surgery. When we move to the next generation of treatments where we're putting in individual cells into layers of the retina, this becomes impossible. And therefore we're also working with Christos Berglas uh, and the robotics group in Kings, which we've formed a joint uh, bioengineering group to create robots to deliver single cells to structures within the retina to allow us to capitalize on new stem cell biology robotic therapy and an understanding of the disease. Working out of King's brand new robotics lab based at St. Thomas's Hospital, Professor Christos Bergelis leads the team developing the robotics side of the collaboration. Ophthalmology is a, is a field that's incredibly mature. So the, the instruments that, you know, these vitroretinal surgeons are using, they are, they are tiny. This is like almost half a millimeter. And you are inserting those instruments through tiny, tiny ports that you do on the eye. And then you have to see through the optical microscope and, you know, try to grasp structures that are as thin as the human hair. So that's how hard vitroretinal surgery is. Now, regenerative therapy delivery is the next step. It's like this set of layers, mm -hmm. but at the bottom part, there is a natural cleavage plane. So when you go all the way to the back of the eye and you bypass all those layers, you reach this natural cleavage plane. So when, it, when you go there, you can feel that you've reached the end. That's where currently therapies are being delivered. But when you want to go, not at the end, but exactly where you need, mm -hmm. in between, then you can't do it by hand. You can't see where you're going, you can't sense where you're going. It's as if you cut the human hair 10 times and then you need to go with one of those tools in between those layers for like two or three minutes, stably, while the patient is awake. And that's, that's something that, you know, humans just cannot do. That's where robots come in. And the body, it's always moving, isn't it? That must be so difficult. And that's why you're trying to do it with robotics. Exactly. And what are we looking at over here? What is this? Yeah, so this is a big scale system. What you can see here is primarily what we call a concentric tube technology. And these are flexible robots that move like, like an elephant trunk. And this is the end effector here. This is the front part of the robot. So, so that's the bit that would go into exactly, the eye. Exactly. So this is big, uh -huh. of course, but we, we are making, you know, these tiny instruments here. So these are more the dimensions that you would expect. So this, I think, is around uh, maybe half a millimeter. This yeah. is probably like one millimeter. So we are aiming towards this size. We want to create a micro scale human hand inside the eye and some of our algorithms are designed to maximize what we call the angular dexterity of the tip so that you could almost do a wristed like motion. So you could really say, well, I want to go in the eye like tangentially or I want to go at a specific angle or I want to be able to grab tissue and lift it. And these, these are the sort of things we are developing, trying out here and then you will see in the operating room how small we can actually make this and how everything is put together. So that is a big version of what we're going to see. Correct. Yes, because imagine this, you know, has to go through the eye so you can understand the, the difference in scales. 
A new working scale prototype has been set up next door and is going to be tested today. Due to coronavirus safety measures, masks were required. This is the mock operating room where things happen. This is where we evaluate our devices and this is the team that makes it all happen. And I've got to check that's not a real body, this is, is it? A, this is a mannequin with, okay. a, with a fake eye, <laughs> even though this operating room is provisioned for cadaveric studies. We have the, the instrumentation, the bigger robotic system that holds everything, the tools, and this is the, the small version of what we have been creating. This tiny instrument there, exactly. That tiny little thing? Yes, this is what Carlo developed uh, over the years, and uh, we are now at the position where, you know, we have everything put together so that we can, you know, uh, try to, to mimic how surgery really happens. Okay. This is a surgical microscope that we use for the visualizations in order to be able to look inside the eye. And finally, the computer stacks in the back is what sends all the control signals to the robot so that it can undertake the motions. So this robot is basically the arm. It's doing the job of the human. Exactly. So it's kind of holding the, the robot that we have developed and then our robot is responsible for the more fine motions. Uh -huh. Systems engineer Ross Henry is responsible for the device's electrical connections and everything that makes it move. This is what you call a haptic manipulator. So essentially when it comes to surgery, the surgeon will be controlling this as if it's a pen. And our end goal is to have the direction and position where he's control pointing this here will be mimicked on the actual robot itself. If you look at each of the motors here, we've got our T1, T2. These are our translational drivers and that will move the robot itself back and forth. And the accuracy we can actually get with these motors is about a hundredth of a, a millimeter. And that's required for subretinal surgery, seeing it's so delicate, uh, the area that we're looking at, it's about a, a tenth of a millimeter. Wow. Mm -hmm. A surgeon might be able to move this 10 uh, centimeters and that might only translate to one millimeter inside the eye, meaning we can get a much more precise uh, position. If we look here, I'll do some rotation so we can see this twisting butt, and then you can actually see here the uh, trolley going along the lead screw. All of the mechanisms and programming have to be finely tuned to give the precision needed for the surgery. Today, they're attempting to manipulate the robotic system within the plastic eye to evaluate the progress on this latest prototype. What they did now is they've set up the instruments, so they, they attached our robot to the bigger robotic system and then they brought it in place next to the patient's eye so that they the, the tool, this fine instrument, can be inserted in the eye and then uh, this is where we would uh, carry out the intervention. So that tiny little thing is those pieces of metal that we were looking at in the other room? Correct. And we are scaling everything down so that they, you know, match the requirements of, mm. of the human eye in vitroretinal surgery. Under the microscope we can now see deep inside the eye and you can just see the robotic arm there as it's being manoeuvred into place. There is still a way to go for the project, but the team hopes the procedure using the robotic system can be trialled on patients within five years. Hopefully we will be able to provide the surgical skill that uh, uh, these therapies require. But in reality, what we also want is that all this effort that is being put in developing those therapies, we take the human precision factor out of the equation. Because a drug is as good as, you know, the place where you put it. So if you have to, to put it extremely precisely and you can't, then it's all the effort it means. So we are coming in as the second pillar of this sort of regenerative technology uh, arsenal that will be there for for eye diseases, for potential, you know, Alzheimer's and implantation of stuff in the brain. And so we are bringing the precision into the delivery of the therapies. Hopefully one day it will actually solve the problem. Um, I, I can't see it being soon enough for myself, but um, my daughter had the precursor of macular degeneration, so obviously for her, it's going to be good, you know, it will be a, a, a life changer, yeah, hopefully. The concept that you could grow a piece of body and put it in after the disease has taken away the function 
see the function return safely is a dream that most um, people working in, in the field of stem cell transplantation or stem cell biology have been dreaming a long time. And certainly this is one of the early breakthroughs in the sense of achieving that, creating something you need in a, in a sense where it's missing and being able to transplant it successfully and seeing visual recovery and seeing safety. So all of the components and all the collaborators are very happy because each of their components has worked well in the final output, which is seeing a patient see better. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and hit the bell button below for notifications. We'll see you next time.